Hello and welcome to Intro to Vegetation Use Cases with Hyperspectral. My name is Megan Gallagher. In this section of the Hyperspectral Academy, we're going to do an overview of Hyperspectral's ability to analyze vegetation. We will be covering information from general band interactions with important vegetative features to what those are used for in both agriculture and forestry. First, let's talk about why remote sensing is important for monitoring and understanding vegetation. Spatially, either with crops or forests, they cover a large portion of the Earth's surface. And if you're not directly in the field, it is very difficult to get that information. Monitoring and understanding crops over large areas or in areas of mixed farming is necessary for crop data layers and background that is used by many government agencies, as well as for forecasting yield. Species classification with remote sensing can save large amounts of money as the ability to ground truth entire forests or coastal vegetation is very expensive. Remote sensing allows for minimal amounts of groundwork to be used for high accuracy results. When we're talking about vegetation in remote sensing, we tend to focus on two different aspects, plant health and plant species. Both of these factors can be very important to understand down to a singular plant scale. And there's a lot of historic research and study in the many different factors that are in play. Things such as changes in the plants based on seasonality, when the plants are changing their leaf cover or losing their canopy entirely, to different directionality of planting and how that can affect the monitoring of that canopy, and even monitoring of a specific chlorophyll content to track for species-specific diseases. We commonly have to use time series analysis, so multiple images over the same area to get plant classification with multispectral imagery because it's just so hard to pick out those tiny details. So why do we want to use remote sensing and especially hyperspectral when we're looking at vegetation? Vegetation is sensitive to light from UV to infrared because this is necessary for the process of photosynthesis. When vegetation absorbs light, the energy from it is mainly used in three different ways. A large percentage of it is used for infrared radiation for transpiration for water content. The next largest percentage is used by visible radiation for leaf pigmentation to make sure photosynthesis works. And a much smaller percentage is used for absorption in the UV that can show us some fluorescence in the longer wavelengths. Because plants absorb so much of the energy of the light that hits them, they have very strong absorption features in the low energy spectrum, blue, green, and red. Then there's a sharp turn at about 700 nanometers, which is the red edge. This is because that is where the chlorophyll drops off. This can give us a lot of information about plant health, such as the steepness of that red-edged cliff and the lower bounds of visible light, and the higher bounds, then, of the near-infrared. Photosynthesis takes place in the chloroplast, which contains chlorophyll, probably the most well-known pigment that is part of plants, giving them their many different kinds of green. Besides chlorophyll, there are some other pigments that are commonly used for looking at vegetation with remote sensing, including alpha and beta carotene. These have different absorption areas in different parts of the spectra that can give us information on both the species and health of the plant. All plants have chlorophyll A and most plants have chlorophyll B, so we can use these as known indicators. When plants begin to senesce or when they reach the end of the season and the leaves begin to turn color, this leads to the chlorophyll decreasing quicker than the carotenoids, so alpha and beta carotene. And we get this decreased reflectance in about the 400 to 500 nanometer range, which leads to yellow leaves. As the leaves die, we get an increase in tannins. These changes in these specific areas are known and give us a lot of information on what exactly is happening on the chemical level of the different vegetation we are monitoring. Let's take a look at some of the spectral information you can see with hyperspectral imaging. First, in the blue and our lower wavelengths, we are able to get things such as information on leaf water content, as well as some areas for chlorophyll A and B responses. Once we get into green, as you would expect, we get some information on leaf nitrogen pigment and total chlorophyll content. In red, we're able to get some more information on chlorophyll absorption and the biophysical quantities of the plants themselves. Red edge is very important for vegetative stress. We're able to get a lot of our stress factors in this area, as well as some more information on our chlorophyll content. And as we start going into the near infrared, or NIR, we're getting more biophysical quantities because the reflectance here responds more so to the volumetrics of the plants themselves. So this will give us more information on how exactly the leaf is made, 
and those changes in reflectance response will also give us some information on moisture content. Finally, when we get to the far near infrared, we get some more biophysical quantities, moisture and water sensitivity, because this area is once again a little bit more affected by the physical properties of the plant itself. Spectra, a word that has been used a few times, is the data number that comes from a pixel and shows you what it looks like for every single wavelength. This is used to see how healthy vegetation is, and especially to try to find out what kind of species or subspecies it is. Because minor changes in the spectra will show us changes in the color and the chlorophyll in the leaves themselves. Next is spectral indices. These are mathematical equations that focus on specific wavelengths to highlight characteristics of the imagery. Let's take a look at some examples of this. A broadband spectral index, such as the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, is a kind of spectral index used for multispectral systems that have very large broad bands that might average over the total color of which they cover. This means we can get general information. In the case of NDVI, we can get the greenness responses, but we can't get the specific physical and chemical interactions. When we're using hyperspectral systems, we'll be using narrowband indices. These are using the much smaller wavelength bands of the hyperspectral camera and can pinpoint minor and specific changes that would be otherwise impossible to monitor. One of my favorite narrowband indices is the Plant Senescence Reflectance Index. This is used as a balancing act between chlorophyll and alpha and beta carotene. Because as we've learned, since chlorophyll decreases first, we're able to see the stages in which the plant is actually senescent. This is also scaled from zero to 0 0.35 with zero being healthy, non-senescing plants, and 0 0.35 being very much senescing or stressed. With this, we can get a much better understanding of what is actually happening in our forests or our agricultural fields. With that background set up, then let's take a look at some of the most common vegetation use cases with hyperspectral. The first one of those is species classification or even subspecies classification. What I mean by this is with either ground truth information or with spectra of specific plants, usually in a library of many different kinds of vegetation, these can be used to classify images. There are a lot of different classification techniques. Some work better with hyperspectral, some work better with multispectral. This is based upon what they look like in the imagery and how they group the different features. Deep learning and machine learning techniques can also be trained to highlight the small changes in an image's many bands and pixels for classification as well. Spectral Angle Mapper, or SAM, uses the angle between the spectra that you've collected in an image and the known spectra from a library for ground truth points to classify every pixel in an image. This technique works really well with hyperspectral because it has so much information. It also tends to not overestimate results. Let's take a look at an example of this. Here is one of our images from our tech demonstrator over the Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado in the United States. This area is a very well-known forested area, and we have some ground truth on the different kinds of trees that are found here. Using 30% of the ground truth, we used SAM to create a classification, which you can then see here. We used the rest of the ground truth to get an accuracy result and see just how well that classification did. Next up is a machine learning technique called random forest, totally unrelated to all the other forests we've been talking about, over an agricultural example. We're looking at an image a little bit west of Stockton, California in the Central Valley, which is well known for its abundance of crops. We once again use 30% of the ground truth data, this time collected by the USDA crop map, focusing on permanent crops such as orchards and then compared that to 70% of our ground truth for our accuracy results. Lastly, let's talk about subspecies classification. Here we have an image of Senegal. There are multiple kinds of mangrove trees in this imagery, and using hyperspectral, we can actually even see them just by the minor changes in the red coloration used here. The last thing we're going to talk about in this section is using hyperspectral imagery to take an in-depth look at vegetation health. There are a lot of ways to monitor general health of a plant. Even using NDVI to look at greenness can give you an estimate on an area's overall production. However, it will not go into the details of what is actually wrong with an area, like understanding moisture content, or to figure out exactly what kind of disease or pest is infecting that area. This can be an essential process over large areas or areas that are difficult to get to physically. An example of this is all over the Northern Hemisphere. There is a very large problem with a kind of pest called a bark beetle. 
There are many kinds of bark beetles, and some of them are a lot worse than others. These beetles will infest a tree, have their young, eat it all, and then spread to all the trees around them, and by that time it's too late. During these stages, the trees go through three different kill stages. Green kill, red kill, and gray kill. Green kill is when a tree is infected by beetles. Red kill is when the tree is dying and the young of the beetle have already spread to all the other trees around it. And gray kill is when the tree is dead. It's important to know where and when this is happening because the spread of bark beetles can cause large areas that are more vulnerable to fire and can destabilize mountainsides. The amount of dead trees has a lot of impacts on the nature and ecology of the areas as well. With hyperspectral, we're able to see the changes in chlorophyll versus the other pigments very early on to show the early stages of bark beetle infestation, to even catch it during the green kill to hopefully mitigate and remove the bark beetles before they can spread to the other trees. Let's take a look back at that image of Rocky Mountain National Park because it's full of trees and it's also unfortunately full of beetles. We we're able to get some ground information about the bark beetle infestations in that area and use that to take a look at the general health of what was affected by the bark beetles and the ones that were not. Here is a large tree stand that is separated from everything else that has an indicator of a bark beetle called an eastern pine beetle, which honestly isn't one of the worst. They're pretty natural for this area, but we're able to see the kind of effect they have on the trees here. This is a healthy vegetation response with low reflectance in the blue, green, and red, and very high reflectance in the near infrared versus the area that is affected by beetles, which has a much higher reflectance response in the blue, green, and red, and a much lower response in the near infrared, meaning that this area is not doing so well health-wise. These same techniques of specifically looking at changes in chlorophyll, as well as many other vegetation indicators, work just as well in agricultural fields, highlighting things like fungus, for example, wheat rust, or diseases, and even relations to nitrogen and phosphorus content from the fertilizer used. Thank you very much for watching our vegetation use cases for hyperspectral video. I hope it gave you an introduction to the power of hyperspectral monitoring for agriculture and forestry.